just want to say thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Hammond. I'm the Vice President of Utility Solutions here at GridPoint. Um, I'll introduce my uh, two additional panelists um, shortly, uh, but to kick things off, uh, we're going to be discussing a whole building approach to demand response on today's webinar. And a whole building approach focuses on a holistic manner to provide reliable ongoing load reductions from buildings, as opposed to a point solution such as a smart thermostat, a water heater, or a single asset. A whole building approach ensures both the certainty of the load resource while also providing valuable operational benefits to end users, including minimizing site comfort issues and other potential impacts to business continuity. By focusing on the whole building, technology providers can ensure that DR program participation is beneficial to a customer's business operations and will drive savings and new revenue and opportunities to their bottom line while providing reliable load reductions from a demand response back to the grid. Uh, thanks for moving forward there, Marcia. Uh, what we will cover on today's uh, webinar, um, we'll cover topics including the challenges facing the US energy grid and how DR can meet these challenges. The benefits of focusing on the under-addressed and underutilized small and medium business segment for DR program participation, and how new revenue opportunities, uh, sorry, and how new technologies turn buildings into reliable grid resources that can be treated similar to other utility generation assets. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, I'm Andrew Hammond, and I'm joined by uh, Dave Lohman, who is GoodPoint's Senior Vice President of Engineering, as well as Deepak Buharaja, who is our SVP of Strategy and Product. Uh, we'll be having a, a bit of a discussion format, um, and as I get this kicked off, I'll be handing it to Deepak and Dave uh, to speak a little further about some of the uh, key issues and trends we're seeing uh, today. As we all know, there's a myriad of challenges facing the US energy grid today. As we've seen recently in California and Texas, extreme weather and fires are driving grid outages, and due to climate change, will most likely become an ongoing issue year after year for the foreseeable future. EV load is forecasted to significantly increase the demand on the electricity grid through 2045, and the additional variability of renewable assets as the new dominant generation resource is providing new you know, challenges uh, from a policy, a market mechanism, and a technology standpoint uh, that need to be addressed and overcome. All of these issues are leading to a crisis of grid reliability and, and energy affordability and require new technologies and approaches in order to face down these challenges over the next decade plus. But there's good news. A whole building approach to demand response can help solve for all of these challenges. Next slide, please. All right, now we're gonna get into the, the meat of the, uh, the webinar here. Uh, in this section, Deepak's gonna address how a whole building approach to commercial DR provides value to all associated stakeholders, from the utility to the end user to technology partners and how a value stacked approach drives reliable load curtailments that do not impact an end user's day-to-day -day operations. Deepak, who are the key stakeholders that can gain benefits from DR participation? And how does a whole building approach wipe away many challenges facing both commercial customers and the US energy grid? Yeah, great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I think uh, even before I get into that question, let me first begin with explaining what demand response or DR is. Uh, uh, during certain peak periods in the year, the energy grid can get into sometimes what we call as supply constraints because there are times when all customers uh, have high demand at the same time. Think about a hot summer day when uh, all the air conditioners are running full at full power and the uh, renewables that basically the solar generation is slowing down at that time. So at that time, the grid is under a supply constraint where it cannot provide energy to all customers uh, when it's required. So they really have two options. One, either they purchase energy on spot, which is generally uh, from a peaker plant or not very carbon friendly, or number two, which is uh, incentivize customers to reduce their demand. That's where demand response comes in. Uh, DR or demand response is the ability to reduce consumption during peak periods of demand where customers get incentives to do so. 
And uh, if uh, these programs like DR programs, if managed properly, they can really turn into a virtual power plant uh, that provide additional capacity uh, to the grid in a very reliable, really low cost, uh, and also instantaneous manner. Uh, DR programs can really benefit uh, and be a strong resource across different stakeholders. For instance, for utilities, they can be a really cost-effective way of managing the supply constraint, like I talked about a minute back. For businesses, they can be another revenue stream while promoting their sustainability goals. And for technology partners, uh, it would basically enable them to create a holistic building solutions that can offer a myriad of services uh, to those businesses while serving the grid and with the underlying message and the key goal around sustainability, uh, making a big carbon impact across the board. These DR programs have been around for a while, but in many, uh, in years in past, they've been primarily focused on large industrial style buildings because those large buildings have strong con concentrated use within a given building. Thus one building can make a sizable contribution to the grid. Uh, but we've also seen that the growth in these in that particular sector of market in DR has slowed down. Not because DR is less important, but because the total addressable market is getting limited. And that really drives uh, the overall industry and the utility to start looking beyond those large, uh, large buildings. So, and that's where the opportunity comes in for the uh, small business or the medium-sized uh, small and medium-sized buildings. This is a really large and fairly untapped sector for grid reliability and demand response. And, and a one which is not been very heavily used until now. In fact, there was a study by PJM which uh, said about, there was about 47% of DR participation were large industrial style buildings and less than 10% by retail services, offices or small businesses. And the reason is because those businesses uh, require something that is really cost-effective, small, automated solution that is really not impacting their business. And why is that section of market important? Because there, there are a lot of those buildings in the US. There, there are about 5.6 million commercial buildings in the US and 4.2 million of those are under 50,000 square feet, which is a lot of, a lot of buildings to tap into this resource. It's given that each of those buildings will contribute a much smaller load. And that's probably one of the main reason why utilities have in past not directly reached out to those customers because it's not cost effective for a utility to reach out to those individual buildings one at a time. Uh, so, uh, and because what utilities are looking for is a kind of easier customer acquisition, a more flexible dynamic load that they can manage in an automated fashion. And, these individual buildings by themselves can offer that, but in small chunks, one at a time. So, but in, in aggregation, these buildings, even though there's small load, uh, one at a time, but hundreds and thousands of those together are more meaningful and more powerful than a single large commercial building. But they, to bridge the gap between these commercial, small to medium sized commercial buildings and utility, we need somebody like a technology partner to come in, in the middle there. That's, uh, I think, Marcia, if we move to the next slide, please. And that's the primary role for a technology partner because they can act as an aggregator across those, those small individual businesses and create a uniform view of communication and connectivity for the utilities. So the key drivers for, uh, or key hindrances for the utility has been around acquiring those customers in a cost-effective manner, having a uniform interface, uh, and being able to do uh, connection with those buildings in an instantaneous and reliable manner. All of those things can be handled by the partner. In many ways, the technology partner can connect those individual buildings to create a network of those buildings and treat them as, an, as a large enterprise or even a large single building. Because at the end of the day, what matters to the utility is have a highly targeted uh, geolocation uh, focused uh, and near instantaneous load available. Whether it's coming from one building or hundred of those, it really doesn't matter. In fact, it is more advantageous to be localized in a, uh, through a small business, uh, 
targeted load through a small businesses, uh, which is spread across an area, because then you can cater to a specific substation or specific load zone where the grid requires or where they're feeling biggest congestion or the supply constraint at that point. So the key message here is uh, that the technology partner is trying to solve for the connectivity and access to multiple of those smaller businesses together easier. But there's one more hindrance to solve for, which is uh, how do we make it attractive for those businesses? Because like I said a minute back or so, that each of these buildings have a small load, like a couple of kilowatts is not going to be in, in attractive enough for the utility for one building. But when you aggregate those, a thousand of those, suddenly it's a meaningful load. But for those individual business owners, it is still that small piece of load that they are contributing to the grid when required. So the revenue stream that come out of a demand response uh, or rebates around uh, the uh, DR capabilities are many times by itself not enough to move the needle for those smaller businesses. That's the whole uh, rationale where in terms of value creation, we talk about uh, uh, kind of layers of the cake or stacked value of multiple of these capabilities pulled together. It all starts together from the technology partner or a smart building provider to first create a meaningful business case around the energy savings. Everything gets stacked up from there through, uh, through a, a data-driven platform. Uh, these companies could create significant energy savings through real-time reporting, through real-time visualization of what's happening on those sites and, thus, and managing the comfort and creating an ongoing energy saving for those buildings. And then the layer on top of that, the uh, DR savings or incentives. Layer on top of that, additional whole building uh, capabilities through managing different assets together. And this is where uh, I think one of the biggest value of looking at the entire building together plays a bigger role than looking at individual assets. To give you an example, you might have a really good smart thermostat company managing a thermostat effectively by itself uh, and at times even contributing to the grid for that thermostat. So the business might believe that they are contributing to the grid by uh, managing the thermostat effectively during a grid event. But they have the thermostat has no idea what other resources are doing within the building at that time, other appliances are doing at that time. Maybe there's an EV getting charged at the same time when uh, the thermostat is in a curtailment mode. Maybe uh, there are other things, maybe the storage is charging at the same time. So then the multiple assets, they might work against each other during a given program, thus negating the effect for the whole purpose behind a, a given curtailment event. That is the value. That's one of the fundamental values that brings in, is brought in by a holistic whole building solution provider where they really orchestrate multiple assets together to create the maximum impact for the grid while minimizing the impact at the site. I think both of those are important because if, uh, if you disrupt the operation for a given business, they are less likely, in fact, highly unlikely to ever participate in a DR program. But if you focus too much around the uh, comfort on or the operation of the business, then you minimize the impact for the grid. So creating a careful balance between the grid impact or maximizing the grid, grid impact while managing multiple assets coordination together is where uh, the biggest advantage of a technology partner comes in. And on top of that, this value creation can be further uh, significantly emphasized by innovative business models like project financing. So you could basically set the whole thing up at zero dollars upfront, which means you get paid right from day one from, your, from energy efficiency. And then you put gravy on top of that by doing DR and other incentives across multiple assets. And then it becomes a long-term ongoing relationship for the utility and that site. And again, one site by itself might not be a uh, significant juice for the grid, but when you combine those across hundreds and thousands of sites, it becomes a really meaningful impact for the customers uh, and for the grid. And to show you as, a, as an example of a business case there, uh, if you move to the next slide, we'll see this is a real example for a quick serve restaurant, which has uh, more than 2000 sites across the country where they 
initiate the program where they would basically have uh, each of those restaurant and uh, those those are generally quick serve restaurants generally have two or three rooftop units uh, or HVAC units that are serving those. So a platform that is controlling and managing those uh, units uh, really ensures comfort for the customer, uh, manages those effectively during on off times and uh, minor tweaks to the HVAC schedule all through the day creates dramatic amount of energy saving. So the solution get paid for itself by the significant amount of savings that are created. The gray bar on top is a small monthly fee that goes in, but the blue bar on the bottom, massive energy savings to start with. So the system gets uh, deployed across the entire fleet. Uh, and on top of that comes in the energy efficiency rebate, DR incentives. Uh, a massive aggregated overall capacity gets enabled for the grid while uh, creating significant value and longevity for the customer. So this is where you really combine energy efficiency and demand response to create a really strong uh, customer experience while generating dramatic amount of impact in an instantaneous manner through to the grid. And I really want to emphasize on the fact on the instantaneous manner because uh, without any manual intervention in a fully automated fashion uh, across multiple types of programs across the country, the DR, pro, uh, the DR system could run uh, and, uh, and at the same time, the site comfort uh, or occupancy is not really impacted during those events as well. So this is basically one of the rare examples where it's win, win, win across the board. The customer gets uh, significant saving, the utility gets a dramatic amount of uh, dynamic load available. It's all tied towards the message around sustainability and uh, the system is set up for a long relationship uh, for the utility, for the customer, and for the partner. So this is one example where everything kind of really comes together in a holistic manner. Deepak, one of the historical challenges for demand response participation has been kind of the ongoing incentive, you know, incentives and the benefit to a commercial end user. It seems like this model and meeting the needs of all the different stakeholders involved, like you said, with that triple win, really kind of takes away some of those barriers to entry where you're kind of single threading the potential, you know, stakeholder value by having this more holistic whole building approach. Is that the case? 100% uh, right. I think this, uh, this really changes the paradigm because even for the customer, instead of investing in multiple uh, platforms to do multiple things, you basically look at a single unified platform that plays on both sides of the meter, which is supporting the grid and supporting the customers. And I think Dave will get further into this, but one of the challenges also, I think historically has been for businesses, you know, the, the operational impact or the perceived operational impact through participation in demand response and other utility type programs. Um, a whole building approach would seem to address that as well as not just the energy related um, you know, results that we see here, but also understanding how you know, this can overlay with an end user's actual day-to-day -day business operations. Yep, great point, Andrew. And I think as, uh, as we move forward uh, in, the, in the webinar, uh, I wanna uh, introduce Dave to talk through the technology trends. And maybe Dave, if you can uh, chime in and give a thoughts on uh, the point that where, and maybe share where is the demand response going in the next two to five years from now? Sure. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about all of that. So uh, let's start with uh, technology trends uh, in terms of all of the assets and the equipment. So, so technology is playing a role in terms of the assets themselves. There's a, an increasing range of diverse assets fulfilling a wide range of functional capabilities for businesses and more of them are ready for DR. So you have more opportunity to bring in uh, different assets into a demand response program. Then you have more automation in terms of monitoring those assets so that you have uh, continuous profiling of their performance. You can identify faults. You can actually uh, take uh, uh, poorly performing assets out of service, have them serviced and corrected, 
put them back into their operational reserves pool so that they can be available again for future demand response events. And then uh, lastly, on the utility side, I mean, there's just this networking capability across so many uh, sites and then within those sites, so many assets. And so when you collect all of that together, you have a wide range of options in terms of actual response to demand response events. And what you see here on this slide, uh, if you look at the upper part on the right, this is um, a geographic map of California, obviously, and it's showing the different regions, geographic regions where different programs are occurring. And then you've got basically uh, smaller and, and larger concentric circles that are showing the response to specific events. And so that's giving you some idea of the uh, precision and pinpointedness that you can call assets and sites into for demand response events. The, uh, the lower section here is actually showing you the response on an aggregate scale across multiple sites of, of their performance. And you, you see actually in this case, uh, a couple of days of events. And at the top of uh, each of those relative peaks, there's a dip, which is uh, actually the performance during the demand response event. That's actually showing you the uh, performance of the sites to respond to that, lowering the aggregate demand across the grid. But anyway, um, coming back to you know, the technology aspect, it's really about intelligent controls that are being deployed at all these sites. It's actually promoting a whole building approach. It's facilitating a whole building approach. It's, it's maximizing the potential of a whole building approach. And then um, you're just being able to finally pinpoint those assets when needed in an automated way uh, so that you can precisely respond to those events um, on the grid when the demand is, is peaking and when the supply is, is running a little short. Um, another thing to consider with some of these assets that are coming online, the storage systems, um, EVs and, and whatnot, uh, you're getting into duty cycles. And those duty cycles have relative time ranges. Uh, solar performance starts to wane in the late afternoon and the early evening, but other assets such as storage can come online. And so uh, you'll see events, per particularly at those transition times to help manage the overall grid, especially as, as Deepak was mentioning earlier on the hot summer days. Um, so I think, you know, one other concern though was what is the impact to businesses because you have uh, a whole building approach and more zones inside all of these uh, buildings uh, with more of these assets. That's how you can actually orchestrate the right response for the event, depending on the amount called for of curtailment. Uh, also, depending on what uh, areas of your business uh, are, are critical and can't be interrupted uh, in any way. And then most importantly, because this is all spread out in a very thin impact layer, it's, it's not even really noticeable for the business. That's the key thing. Because of the technology improvements that have been made, because of the uh, response times being immediate, and because of the performance of the assets, it's combining energy efficiency with the demand response program and with the fine granularity in, in being able to control those assets that is really the win-win situation. So I think that's that's kind of, in a nutshell, the technology and improvements. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, I appreciate um, all your, uh, all the talk there. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in through um, the chat. Also, again, just remind everybody you are, um, please uh, go ahead and feel free to type any questions in the chat and we'll go ahead and answer them or to the Q&A. <clears throat> First question that uh, came in, uh, does this solution only work for national chains? Sure, uh, this is Deepak, I can take that. So I think uh, that's kind of, a, it's actually a really good question because intuitively you would think uh, a large uh, national chain with hundreds of thousands of stores uh, would be already doing the, uh, some of these programs? The answer is yes. Uh, think about uh, those chains, uh, those larger national accounts. They, they do have energy managers who would focus on those things. And one of the reasons why it uh, has worked for them is because they already have that network of building in their mind with uh, hundreds of thousands of sites. But when you, when you think about from a utility perspective, a given quick serve restaurant, for instance, uh, whether it is 
a part of a thousand store or a single store. The load that is getting contributed is at the single store level. So it doesn't matter whether it is a national account or national chain or a single store or a mass market, it is contributing the same amount. And the ability for a technology partner to come in to create a network of, of those hundred or thousands or even more of those buildings together in some ways creates its own enterprise view. So whether you are already a part of a national chain or you're a standalone small business, it doesn't matter. It, these demand response and these programs are available to all and are equally valuable to all. And I would just add one thing to that quickly. Um, by taking a whole building approach and focusing on you know, energy efficiency and the ongoing um, uh, efficiencies and, and energy savings, as well as the uh, automated demand response, you're gonna drive you know, deeper, more persistent savings for that single site. So from an end user's perspective, you know, Deepak, I think was speaking more from a grid perspective. When you look at a single building, you know, a site to site, you know, five or 10 kilowatts is, is not gonna differ greatly, whether it's an enterprise or, you know, a mom and pop type operator. But if they are, you know, looking at it from the lens of the end user, having a more holistic whole building approach is going to drive additional value beyond just demand response alone. That's going to serve, you know, the needs of the customer, the needs of the utility from a long-term participation standpoint, and then provide, you know, continuity and a good customer experience for the technical uh, technology partner as well. Great, next question that came in, uh, is demand response available across the country? I'll take that one. Um, Yes, there's uh, obviously some key markets. You know, California uh, is is well known. Texas is very well known and has been uh, both in the in the news as of late due to a, a lot of the extreme weather and fire and other uh, grid challenges uh, that have impacted uh, both of those um, systems. But demand response, you know, has been around for 20 plus years in markets across the country. Um, so it's key when you're talking to, you know, a provider or a technology provider or a partner of understanding, you know, do they operate nationwide or do they operate in certain key markets? Because for, you know, partners and for utilities and for customers nationwide, they should be able to tap into these programs, uh, whether that's at, you know, the California independent system operation level or an individual utility level. Um, and so having a provider with the breadth of experience is key to really ensuring that you have that whole, you know, coverage across the country. Great, next question. Uh, how can the curtailment be automated on sites that do not have the technology or the BMS in place to do so? Yeah, I, I can take that one as well. So I think the, the biggest thing is to be really interactive and be available on site, you need some system responding from the site to the grid. I think that's the, that is one of the advantages that a technology partner can come in because they can be the unified platform to provide both of those. And also at uh, no capital uh, based on some of the incentives, some of the uh, rebates that are, are available for those EE programs because many of those uh, rebates are aligned towards EE. Some of those are aligned, aligned towards the DR which is energy efficiency and demand response. So combined uh, incentives there can make the uh, adoption of that EMS technology a lot easier, but to really have a unified solution uh, contributing from the site, it is important to have a solution on site that can talk to a central system that talks to the utilities uh, for, uh, for a lot more stronger grid interactivity. I, I would add to that as well. Um, you know, there's a myriad of technologies out there and you have, you know, the, the pure kind of software aggregators um, who really sit, you know, not at the site level, really at the aggregation level. Um, and their, you know, kind of biggest hurdle uh, is being able to connect to those assets on site, on site. So, you know, not every asset can be integrated from a automated demand response software perspective. Whereas you also then have vertically integrated, um, uh, you know, uh, technology providers that install, you know, monitors, meters, control systems on a site, 
um, that then can um, you know roll up into the the overall aggregation layer. Um, then you have folks that have a, a, a kind of a one size fits all approach that have the ability of coming in and, and vertically integrating through hardware on site, but then also connecting through their software platform to some assets on site. And that's something that you know we see a lot of, especially as you start getting into battery storage and generators and EV charging platforms that have their own controls. You wanna be able to integrate them into the whole building controls platform so that you overcome that single point issue and provide the holistic nature of um, you know, calling on those different assets in a very intelligent manner, like David mentioned earlier. Um, and then have that be addressable to the widest, you know, net, uh, the widest range of buildings nationwide. So it's not really a one size fits all approach, but having, you know, a provider uh, with a platform that is expandable and future proof is really key to addressing, you know, the most customers in the most markets nationwide. And just uh, excellent response. And, and also to just fill in one point, it's, it's kind of meeting the customer where they are, because you're going to have a range of diverse assets. Some are capable of uh, directly participating and some not, but having a range of options to integrate is exactly right, because you can meet the customer where they are. Yeah, I must say, I love the questions and really appreciate the participation across the board here. Yep. And um, maybe we go down to the next question. Yes, uh, next question. Would a multi-tenant building participate in VR? Yeah, I think absolutely yes. Because uh, the way we, we are looking at demand response is that uh, demand response is about multiple types of assets really working for the grid at certain times, whether it is an HVAC, uh, an EV charger, energy storage generator, all of those types of assets working in cohort whether they are part of a smaller business, larger site or a multi-tenant site, all of those are different means for participating in the, system, uh, in the program. So yes, all of, uh, short answer is yes. I kind of give a little bit elaborate one as well. Yeah, and I think each of those customers can participate to the level that their, uh, their situation permits. And so they're gonna have separate enrollment agreements uh, associated with the demand response program that they're a part of. And, and so depending on what's being called for, uh, one, more, or all of those tenants in the same building would, would probably respond. Great, okay, our next question, uh, there's a couple questions in here. Does the platform integrate easily with a BAC net IP systems? This is the first part of this question. Yep, all right, Daniel, great question again. Uh, so I think one of the, uh, importance and also an advantage of having a, a strong, reliable technology partner like GridPoint uh, is that uh, you you work across multiple types of assets. So uh, GridPoint in this case absolutely works with BACnet systems. So there are BACnet integration directly to the HVAC units and also there's ability to communicate via BACnet to other systems. Uh, and the uh, and we do work with uh, local contractors uh, and for installation purposes. And we do have a certified list of contractors that we basically uh, train and support for all EMS system installation. And also from a uh, kind of customer touch points from a uh, kind of customer relationship from a selling perspective as well. Yeah, and again, just on the, on the back net integration, I think um, BACnet is an open standard protocol. It's part of what many uh, integrators would offer as uh, a direct interface that they can manage and support in demand response programs. And I think you see a lot of that. And so open, open protocols is a big part of that interoperability uh, and readiness to be able to participate. And so, yeah, I think in general, I mean, it depends on the specific device, but in general, yes, BACnet systems are, are definitely um, able to participate. Great, I've got two more questions here. Uh, one of them, oh, a couple more, sorry. Uh, how are the stores impacted during the event? Yeah, oh, Dave, why don't you want yeah, to- Yeah, no, I'll, well, I, I kind of alluded to that earlier, but um, really 
they're, they're impacted in the sense that there is some curtailment going on, but because uh, you can really manage that curtailment just to respond to the exact needs, it's really minimal. It's not really impacting comfort. In many cases, there is a pre-event period where you can actually boost your performance to offset any decline in uh, comfort impact during the event. The event duration will be a factor, but in general, because of the multi-zones aspect of the business, especially in the whole building approach, uh, you can distribute this across your uh, least likely to be impacted areas. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, you can manage these events in such a way across zones, across devices, that there's virtually no impact. And also, I think it's key to mention, um, when you are going in and enrolling that customer and working on their nominations and you know educating them about the benefits of demand response, you as a you know as a technology provider, as a service provider, you know as a utility should be mindful about those business operations um, and use that to really understand the, the risk levels and the risk mitigation that you can provide through your curtailment strategy that you recommend to that customer. I don't know how many of you saw it. There were a ton of, of uh, news articles uh, last winter when the uh, grid issues were happening in Texas. There was one on the front page of the Wall Street Journal actually that talks specifically and quoted residential customers in Texas who were unaware that through signing up for their smart thermostats, that they were agreeing to a five, four or five degree curtailment. That's not mitigating the customer's risk. They were pretty ticked off about that when they kind of, you know, by not reading the, uh, the fine print. So it's really important to set the right expectations and understand, you know, if a customer has a quick serve restaurant, they're gonna have different assets and they're gonna have different operating procedures than if they have a retail site or a gas station or even a full serve restaurant. And understanding those nuances and being able to translate that down to your curtailment strategy is essential for minimizing those impacts to a business and their potential site um, uh, comfort issues. Great, okay, last question that we have. Uh, again, another one from Daniel is, can contractors in Canada become dealers? Yeah, so I'll just expand on Deepak's uh, comment earlier. Um, we work with, train, certify, and support both, you know, dealer partners and contractor partners across all of North America. Uh, we do work in Canada uh, with, uh, with Bell, the, the large telecom provider up there. Um, and we do a lot of work, you know, with and through them in all the provinces across Canada. And we have contractor partners who handle the installations um, uh, and, and certain other aspects, service warranty, things of that nature. Um, so it is something we're always looking for good qualified partners. And, um, you know, if you're interested, we can let you know at the end of this, um, this webinar, you know, where you can go on our, on our website to contact us for more information. Okay, thank you guys so much. That is all the questions that have come through. Well, cool. Well, uh, one last slide, kind of some, uh, some takeaways here. Um, and then unless there's any other questions, uh, we thank everyone for your time today. But, um, you know, as, as we've spoken about today, you know, whole building demand response, it's ready. It's something that, you know, folks like Gridpoint have been doing for a decade or more. Uh, it's very cost effective, it's reliable, and it's a flexible approach to grid decarbonization, as well as pro providing reliable demand response uh, to grid uh, operators and utilities nationwide. As Deepak pointed out, 94% of all building stock in the US are 25,000 square feet or less, but only 10% of those SMB, those small and medium business customers are currently participating in demand response. So this is a very untapped underutilized market and it really provides a big opportunity for reliable capacity. Um, and really we can't sell short the value of distributed DR. 
as Dave mentioned earlier, the locational value, the temporal value, you know, getting very surgical on the grid with small buildings provides a much larger impact overall to the grid's operations and your local distribution system than one, you know, large industrial site that is sited only in one part of the uh, one part of your territory. By delivering and partnering with technology partners, you can provide greater value by stacking the benefits and through, you know, innovative project financing like energy management as a service, you can help remove those financial barriers and hurdles to participation. Those are really some of the key reasons that small businesses have not participated in the past. You know, they haven't been able to overcome those, you know, fairly significant barriers to entry. Whereas technology and financial um, uh, fin uh, project financing uh, offers these days allow them to do so. And finally, from a platform, from a technology standpoint, you don't want this to become obsolete. You don't want to go in and install something today that's not going to operate in the next five years and the next 10 years. So having an expandable platform, having an expandable future-proof technology is going to be really important for those future integrations as storage price comes down, as EV charging becomes more ubiquitous, as generators and other you know, DG assets are brought online in, in markets where resiliency and backup are, are key. And so having that kind of future-proof uh, approach is very key to the long-term reliability, but also the long-term cost effectiveness of the technology and the program participation. And that brings us to the end here. Um, we can, you know, we, we finished a couple minutes early. So after I kind of, you know, wrap this up, we can hang on for another five minutes or so if folks have any lingering questions that, uh, that you wanted to mention. But just wanted to thank everyone for uh, your participation today. Um, and for more information, you can go to gridpoint.com forward slash demand response. Um, we didn't want to talk too much about grid point today because this is very much about, you know, education and looking at opportunities out there. But just to, to quickly plug, you know, grid point and, and, and who we are, um, we've been around for about 20 years now. We focus on commercial buildings and commercial building management. We have over 15,000 sites across the U.S. and Canada that are under active management with long term service and support contracts and both energy efficiency and DR uh, program participation. Um, just to throw some, some big numbers at y'all, um, we've saved customers over half a billion dollars in energy costs, which equates to about 6 billion kilowatt hours reduced and over 6 billion pounds of carbon that's been taken out of the atmosphere. So we are excited to, uh, to continue uh, building off the success we've had to date and Again, thank everyone for your time and, and joining us today for this webinar. Thanks everybody.